Uh, do you take total ownership over the framing of all the angles? <laughs> and you know what's funny? Probably yeah, every yeah, yeah. every twenty times you yeah. stand up. <laughs> 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 that magic word. Hand. That's what yeah. our, our we've we've um, five core values, and our first one is total ownership. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. just like it's you know it's our it's part of our part of our. Language. So important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I treated it as adults. I would literally go on holiday for a month. Yeah. And come back, not having had a text or an email the whole month from their office. Amazing. And I'd be in the middle of the bush with the kids and everything, having fun. And then I walk in, they go, "Hey, boss man, you're back. Here's the sales figures. Why don't you bugger off again? We did better without you." <laughs> <laughs> and I created that culture where everyone was a boss. Everyone did their own thing, and it's I loved that because I could. I mean, I'd be like. I'm going to go play golf. And they'd say, great, see you later. Because <laughs> they knew I was driving the, the forefront of the business. Right. I wasn't doing anything day to day. It was all vision, marketing, all the sales and marketing, nothing to do with the um, the bits and pieces. Yeah, but like visionary yeah. owners, they just get in the way if they're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> You know and I, mean? I would do it because I'd be sitting there like, <laughs> You'd be tinkering with like the nuts and the bolts. It's like, yeah. stop it, Mark. You're going to break things. <laughs> and I'd go, I'm getting out of here. And I, I, and I started other business because I was getting bored sitting there watching other people work. But sure. knowing if I tinkered, I'd ruin yeah. it. But to see, the funny <laughs> thing about you is it's like you go to play golf and you just generate like revenue for the company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> put put the, the fees through Malone Golf Club fees. Put that through the box and it's expense. <laughs> but it's cool. You know, you and I are in, we're in the people business and yeah. we're really in the in the have a good conversation, have a bit of crack yeah, yeah. sort of uh, yeah. business. So, yeah, it's all good. You happy with uh, Mark's mic? Is that okay for you? Sounding okay, Daniel? Uh, you can just uh, tell me what you're grateful for, Mark, please. Sorry? Can you just tell me what you're grateful for? <laughs> uh, me, I'm grateful for the opportunity of being here today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping all this in, by the way. This is good fun. Yeah, I think we should give it in. Daniel is going to be jumping in like yeah. um, throughout as well today. Yeah, so, great. Um, yeah, look, really excited to chat to you. I think yeah. it's it's going to be a lot of fun. I've already enjoyed from the coffee shop to the studio. The the crack's been really good. So I think it's going to be good. So yeah, we're going to go all over the place today. Like personal story, business story. Uh, you come extremely highly recommended by a couple of people. You just got back. Yep. Yep. Just had three and a half months in Africa. Unbelievable. Um, sort of my, I've had a long time in Belfast and yeah. always wanted more time in Africa. And is that uh, accent Balamino or Bali Castle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I grew up in Zimbabwe. Mm. Um, and now I've got this strange twang of Belfast stroke Zimbabwe. That's and, perfect. Uh, you're the global citizen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're the picture, <laughs> yeah. the picture of us all. So yeah. born on a farm? During a well, war? Well, well, yeah, I grew up in Zimbabwe, you know, and we had a small holding. It wasn't a big farm. My grandfather had a small holding outside town, and we grew up in there, and we had, we did, like, the good life. We grew all our own food, fetch big orchard. We ate. You walked out and picked fruit off the trees and stuff like that. You wow. know, it sounds idyllic. And we were literally barefoot in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt, running around in the bush, um, living the dream life. And uh, the Rhodesian War was going on. Um but we were in the Midlands, right in the heart of the country, and it was sort of a border war, people coming in from the borders. So we were quite protected from it. We knew people who got involved. We knew people who died in it and everything else. But in our day-to-day -day lives, it, it wasn't affecting us. It wasn't like we were on the farm walking and carrying guns or anything else. We were, we were isolated from that. It's interesting. And like, what was the media landscape like? Would you guys have been <laughs> plugged into your smartphones and getting every single update? Like, w would you have known in real time what was happening around you? Were you really just sheltered? Jeebus, this was back in the 70s. So like, we had black and white TV. We on the farm didn't even have a TV. We, had a, we had, didn't have enough money for a TV when I was growing up in a way. And we'd go to the neighbor's house, watch TV once a week at one stage. And uh, eventually, you know, we got TV as the war went on. There'd be a the news, six o'clock news, and we'd sit, we'll sit down around the TV after dinner. Um, and there used to be a lovely lady, Sally Donaldson. She used to do this broadcast, and she would uh, say, and you hated the word, said, there's been a communique issued by the security forces, and you knew somebody had been killed. They're going to tell you so many people died or whatever. Mm. And I just got a chill down me. You know, it's uh, uh, a strange uh time where we were living this idyllic life but you knew mm. people were you know dying and fighting in this strange strange uh, environment um but we were kids we didn't really know we just played sport and had fun and ran around in the garden and uh, and, and played in the bush sure 
Um, but yeah, no, it was a serious thing. A lot of people died. Mm -hmm. We went through a lot of political change and everything. Um, and it was exciting. Uh, we, we were in white only schools and then it changed while I was at school to wow. Zimbabwe. And we had people of different colors and <laughs> shapes and sizes all come in. And we had to adapt to that and that adapt to coming into our environment. And we had to, and that was really life changing, I'd say, because, yeah, we grew up in a, you, you know, it was a racist white society you know sure. we were you know there's no hiding from that um but it wasn't harsh it wasn't like south africa and apartheid and a, a level like that but you know it wasn't wasn't right i'm not trying to defend it at all but so we had these people come in and we'd play you know you there were you imagine a bunch of guys you're 16 full of testosterone you see a bunch <laughs> of other guys you're all looking at each other they're looking at you and then sport brought us together you'd, wow. be, you'd be going like Hey, this guy's quicker than this guy, or this guy, um, you know, he's stronger. He'll, he'll be a great second row or he'll, whatever. Right. And we played sport with these guys and became pals with them, and that broke down all the barriers. And uh, that's how I ended up with a charity, Sport Changes Life. That was part of the journey, was seeing that sport really does change life. It's very interesting, you know, even how, like, that ex that sets a context for me and explains yeah. so much of even what you already told me as we were saying in the coffee shop yeah. about you know how you've you've dedicated your life to things like travel and sport and so that origin story is really interesting. Did you ever watch anything good on the TV in those days when you were a kid? <laughs> no, that wasn't. Is that it? That it was wasn't, it wasn't like years? great in those days. I can't even remember <laughs> what sort of stuff there was. Programs like Bonanza and you know old westerns, black and white, Gene Autry. I mean, this is stuff you wouldn't even know. Sure. You can go Google that and you'll be... I think, I think Don has maybe heard of a Western, maybe. <laughs> what uh, What was yeah. your favorite thing to pick off the tree and eat? Mulberries. We used to have these, hey, like they were huge, long, juicy mulberries. We had mango trees. I mean, everything was in season. I was talking to my daughter the other day about uh, passion fruit. We called them granadillas and we had those. You just pick one off, bite the end off and squeeze the whole thing in your mouth and, you know... And uh, she's going, that must have been so lovely. I was saying, yeah, that was, you yeah, know, avocados we had. We lived on avocados. And all <laughs> you guys were living your best, like, yeah. superfood, <laughs> ultra-healthy, natural, outdoor, sunlight, barefoot lifestyle. Uh, well, we also liked our ice cream and chocolate and all the rest <laughs> of it as well. You know? But we were running around like mad things, playing a lot of sport and everything. I mean, it's still now you go back out there and you see how slim people are. So, yeah. you know, it's like there is a different diet, a different lifestyle. And whilst obesity globally is catching up, mm -hmm. you, you, they're still out there. You notice so many fitter, healthier looking yeah, yeah. people. You know? It's very interesting. I, I saw a documentary recently and the, oh, the documentary opened mm -hmm. with like loads and loads of different shots of like different animals. And it was like yeah. birds and it was rhinos and elephants and cheetahs and dogs and cats and monkeys. And the voiceover was basically saying, isn't it very interesting how out of all of the species that exist on the planet, the only ones that struggle with obesity is humans. Yeah. And it's very, very powerful. The documentary kind of went on, as you could imagine, to basically just be like, look, in our natural environment, mm -hmm. this does not happen to us. Yeah. This is a disease of progress, for lack of a better yeah. term. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the lifestyle that you lived as a kid that you just described is like every digital nomad, homeschooling, <laughs> you know, TikTok moms watching yeah. dream for, for their family. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and it's yeah. interesting how you said, you know, you had that mm -hmm. and you didn't have a lot of money. No, we, we, had, we had, I mean, we were, um, we struggled. Everything I had when I was a kid was, you know, I remember getting my sister's bike, which she had got, was bought second hand for her to send it to me. My brother got it. That was the way we were. But that was, it wasn't like we, we weren't rich. We weren't poor. We were happy. Wow. I lived in this uh, little bubble with my family where we all loved each other, got on well. We had the staff who worked there and everything had their little village on our land and you got to know their kids and everything else. And we just lived in a little bubble of happy people just getting on with their lives, trying to trying to love and support each other. So, yeah, no, we were very, <laughs> you know, I know I'm making it sound idyllic. But it, but it that's, was. <laughs> but that's my memory of it. Let's yeah, put yeah, it that sure. way. And, and uh, still now, you know, it's... <sighs> my whole love for Africa and everything, a lot of it probably is melancholy in a way. You know, you're looking back at something what was in and thinking, oh, I'll pop up then, it's going to be the same. It never is. You know, everything's moved on. Zimbabwe's moved on. Life's <sighs> moved on. The way you think's moved on. 
So I still have this idyllic dream of Africa, you know, and it's like when I get there, I live it. Yeah. I, I can smell it, feel it. I know yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's tangible. But at the same time, when I get back here, I go back into this melancholy uh, about, you know, the sport I played with my mates. You, we're all still 16 or 17, 18 with your mates. No matter how old you get, you always think back to the glory days type yeah. thing. I, I have a chill now. I know you're going to jump in a second, Daniel. <laughs> uh, did you ever watch the, the series Mad Men? Yeah, yeah. Right, so I, I don't know if you remember this. I've probably watched this scene on YouTube about 100 times. It's like Don Draper, the main character. Mm -hmm. He's a copywriter. He's working yeah. in this big advertised agency. Context, context. And he's pitching, I think it's Kodak, mm -hmm. on this new product. And it's a photo wheel. Mm -hmm. And so it's the first time that you can basically have like a slideshow projector yeah. type thing. And the whole pitch mm -hmm. is around nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And he tells a story. I think it was something like, oh, come on, memory, don't have me down. It's like he had like an old copywriter mentor. Yeah. And he said that nostalgia in Greek, mm -hmm. like literally translates yeah. as the pain from the past. Okay. Yeah. And when you were talking about yeah, yeah. that melancholy in my head, yeah. I was like, it's that nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's probably a bit. And of, it's yeah. and it's like it is painful. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like a it's like a, a longing or mm -hmm. like a pang for the yeah, past. Yeah, yeah. And that is a very, very powerful emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, a, not, yeah. no food to, like mm -hmm. The best ingredient mm -hmm. in any food is nostalgia. Yeah. Like if yeah. I have an apple tart <laughs> that just about kind of yeah. almost reminds me of grannies or mums, yeah. I could nearly weep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, even yeah, now yeah. thinking about yeah. it, I actually get emotional thinking <laughs> yeah, about it. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, and that's the thing. Like I've I've had so many conversations even recently with my friends about the nostalgia, about those days and all that. Mm -hmm. I was like, I remember playing on the street with my older brother, just playing tennis yes. back and forth, back and forth. Whilst nowadays it'd be strange to see a lot of people outside playing yeah. games unless you're really young because like it's just the times of change and all that yeah. Yeah. but even like, you so like, <laughs> like like you're on a big nostalgic video game kick <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yes. tell mark what you just what you've so, just done <laughs> uh it all started with uh matt being uh an absolute g and uh giving me a wee which is whole my oh, childhood yeah, and all that. I forgot about that. Uh, he was Our very Christmas kind. party, we were all like, what, what's the number one thing we want to do? We're like, we want to play Mario Kart Wii. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. But because I, I grew up with the Wii era and all that, mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, thank you so much for that, by the way. Uh, but yeah, basically, absolute nostalgia trip just went and just started playing Mario Kart, loving yeah. the Wii. And recently, another part of my childhood was the Nintendo DS Lite, mm -hmm. the original, like that one there, that uh, I just recently bought it just for a good price and all that, just went and bought it. And I've, as much as uh, the quality is not as good, obviously, yeah. it's still the nostalgia that I get yeah. from my childhood of mm. just going over the memories that I had yeah, playing yeah. those games. Like I remember sitting, my older brother, he had his DS, mm. I had my DS, just playing Mario Kart or Mario <laughs> Bros. <laughs> it's just the nostalgia that it has. It's, it's, it's painful yeah. nostalgia, but it's, yeah, also, it's the pain of the, it, pain of it's, the past. It's, yeah. it's what those good moments that make it so nice as well. At the same yeah. time, just yeah. revisiting those good old memories and all that. And it's like you were saying with playing outside and all that. It was so nice because I, I, as much as I, I wouldn't think too much about it now. I loved those memories I spent with my yeah. older brother and younger brother just playing football outside, yeah. playing tennis, running about, having a good time. But there's a big, yeah. a big move towards that I don't know if it's like mm -hmm. I see, even see like younger gens mm -hmm. even like the, even like Daniel's kind of like group mm -hmm. where it's like they're they're going back mm -hmm. it's like they want the videotape and they want well, the vinyl yeah, yeah. and a bit actual, more tangible yeah. a bit more real yeah, yeah. that nostalgia thing I had my brothers around last night I'm 60 he's 58 and it's amazing we said and we have long chats about back in the day you know like right. growing up on the farm and what about this and then you remember there's a and it's weird how we have different memories of what you, you you remember something is really important, and to him it was like, yeah, really did that happen? And to <laughs> and then he'll say something happened, and I go, yeah, vaguely, but it wasn't a big thing to me. <laughs> and it's amazing how from the same experiences, living in the same place, same time, we've come away so you know different, holding on to different nostalgia, not this. Sure. Yeah, and I love we sit there and we sit for hours just talking about all who we knew then and friends of the folks and people on the next farm or whatever, and we chat away. And, you know, it is that, that painful. Yeah. It's a lovely pain you're going through sort of chatting it through. Yeah, But it's not like that, what you're talking about there is like the subjectivity of the human experience, yeah. you know, like yeah. we all could go through the same thing and get totally yeah. different things out of it. Yeah. 
Oh, we're like and we're like way off topic here, but like yeah. the JFK assassination. I like yeah. how you know they like take all the like in person reports and compile it together, and it's all just fantasy yeah. you know, because it's <laughs> totally. all so different. <laughs> and it's like if that happened with a specific event, yeah. like how how do we ever like go about trying yeah. to handle that for a period of history, or a period yeah. of time, a yeah. family? You know, yeah. it's it's powerful. Yeah. And so, another thing, you know, we talking about was uh, you know you're saying about playing outside and that we played lots in the farm, but more importantly, at school we had a lot of sport in Zimbabwe. Mm. And we went to school in the morning from 8 till lunchtime. Uh, we did the O-levels, A-levels, so marked over in the UK. So we had the f- same education as over here. But we went back in the afternoon did sport four afternoons a week. Four afternoons. Compulsory. Class. And so if you did not turn up for cross country or rugby or whatever, you got caned. It was as important as your lesson. So it wasn't, you know, it was you had to do it unless you had a medical letter. But we loved it. It's not like anyone was chasing us. To get there, we yeah, were yeah. running, running to get there to do it. And we played rugby, cricket, swimming. You did everything. And that was an important. And then Friday afternoon, you might be playing a water polo game against another school. Saturday, you'd be on a bus 100 mile, 200 mile to another school to play rugby or cricket or whatever, because where we lived, the towns were far apart. And, and that was just like every week, you're just doing all the sport, mixing with people, meeting other people from other schools, playing battling hard against them and celebrating afterwards and all the rest of it. And I think that's really missing in the schools and education system. Yeah, you know, I have two daughters brought up in Belfast and everything else. And the big difference I see is, you know, the sport. Um, There's just not the same emphasis put on it. And then we talk about obesity and everything else, you Mm -hmm, know, and mm -hmm. then you suddenly are going, you know, there's ways and, you know, you look at the kids who – play sport. They're not lighter because they play sport and they exercise. They're also thinking about their food and everything else. It's the big domino, isn't it? Yeah. Because if you have a, a gold chase, like I want to get on the A team in whatever mm-hmm. sport, I want to run faster than James. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, it organizes your whole life. Yeah. And you've, yeah. you've experienced this in business. Like once yeah. you have a business goal, your whole life just starts to organize around mm-hmm. that goal. It's very interesting. Yeah. And it is about winning. You know, it is so important, but more important, it's about losing. You lose, and that hurts. Hmm. And you learn from it. It's so good. You know, it's a sort of, you look back at those days, Jeepers, I dropped that catch, which cost the team a match or whatever. Yeah. You don't remember the time you had a six to win a game or anything. You remember the Not time. Not even a little yeah, bit, Mark. <laughs> Not even a little bit. You don't remember it a tiny bit, no? That's what, no, you know what I mean? No, I know what you like, mean. I know exactly The ones you, you wake up with a cold sweat at six in the morning going, Jeepers, can't believe I did yeah, that yeah. So, so, so in our world, that's like you'll get like a thousand uh, positive YouTube comments, yeah. and then one person will be like, "I don't like your hair," and you'll be yeah, like, "And you'll be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be going on and going, yeah, at least you got hair." You know, right? <laughs> Mark, back at us up in the comments. That's class. So uh, this conversation is part of our ongoing series with NI Connections. Yeah, and that's the diaspora department mm-hmm. of Northern Ireland, and we're basically on a mission to like find as many interesting people connected yeah. to Northern Ireland as possible. So um, we were when when we came across mm-hmm. you and your story, Matthew Scott said, mm-hmm. you got to talk to Mark. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So how did you move from Africa? Mm-hmm. And this is, th- feel free to take us down the winding road yeah, yeah. To, to get okay. to here. Um, how did you get from Africa to Belfast? And I should say, actually, I just finished this wee bit off, is niconnections.com is where you can check out uh, <laughs> all sorts of guides and research about how to move to Northern Ireland for the first time, how to set up a business in Northern Ireland, yeah. or if you've been overseas for a long time and you feel, watch this for a tie-in, you feel the pangs of home <laughs> calling you back, that nostalgia, Kings of the Aiken calls it the... Uh, the distant beat of the drum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then at connections.com, they make it super, super easy for you. They've yeah. done all the heavy lifting. They've helped loads and loads of people either move here for the first time or come back. If you want to become a returner, uh, that's one of the easiest ways to do it. Mark, okay. over to you. Okay, yeah. The beat of the drum growing up on the farm where literally a Sunday night there'd be the big party, the drums in the... Uh, in, in, the, in the housing, you know, where, where the work has lived and uh, eventually grew up, um, got into my 20s, got into civil engineering, uh, did a diploma in that. And I worked around the bush in Zimbabwe, building things, hospitals, uh, dam, a high rise building, all sorts of things. And it was wonderful. That was really good because given a huge amount of responsibility at a young age because there was a skill shortage in the country after the war. 
and I lived it. I, I didn't want to leave Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was in a great place. Mugabe was doing a half decent job at the time. Um, the lifestyle, everything was good. People were moving to Zimbabwe. Everything was on the up. Tourist numbers were going through the roof. Victoria Falls, all the rest of these places, uh, safaris, everything. So it was like a wonderful place to be. It was reawakening after the war and going through. A, but I was also like mid twenties, working in the bush. No bars, no nightlife, no girls, no nothing around you for, you know, at times and all the rest. So you sort of, you, you still want to see the world and travel. A young, man, a young man's mind starts to wander <laughs> yeah, exactly. through the, the corners of the, the four corners of the earth in a situation like that. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I'm living here and the world's happening somewhere else. You know sure. what I mean? That was just that. Let's go and spend a year or two. And, and I booked a one year ticket because that's. What, you know, it's like for visas and that, that's all we could do. But I knew I'd be gone for a few years and travel a bit. So I moved to London. There was a, a bit of a boom going on. So I got into civil engineering there. I freelanced around a lot of little projects in it. and was paid a lot of money um, relative to my age and ex- everything else. So I was living a, a good life and working eight or nine months a year. And like, uh, this is maybe borderline, mm-hmm. like, racist I admit I don't even know what the right word is but like was like a salary in London like m- the, the currency exchange was was like massive in comparison to about oh, right lower less same way higher oh yeah no like you, you just couldn't go back to Zimbabwe lying there get a case of beers and it's like three peer beer right you know, you go to a bar, you buy two beers in London, you could buy the whole bar in Zimbabwe. You know, it was so you're, like, so you're, you're, making three, you're making three grand a month. You're like, I could buy all the beer in my in my village. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we literally were like that. I remember at the bowls club, which my folks were at, I was back with my brother-in-law, who I worked with in London, and he's part of the story. I ended up here. So I worked with this guy, and he came out of Zimbabwe with me, Fergal, still a great mate of mine. And uh, so we went out of Zimbabwe um, and we ended up in the bowls club where my folks are and everyone's sitting there having a meal and drinks. And I said to the barman shorty, I said, grab your pen and paper, let's go. And we went up and down the tables and I got an order for the whole bar, or everyone at the bowls club. Nice. And I came back to bar and Fogel was sitting there and he goes, wow, that's going to cost you a lot. I said, but same as two or three beers in London. <sighs> and it literally was like it. You could go out back home and it was it just cost nothing it was amazing crazy so you, yeah. you left a young bushwalker and you came back a prince <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly you know so i was having a great time working in london i bought a camper van traveled to europe for a summer flew to the St- canada one year did twelve thousand miles around canada in the states bought an old car and just drove around and you know spent five months i think it was seeing everything you could see in Canada and the States, fished every river and stream you could, you know. So it was really good experience. It was sort of going, you know, later in life I'll take life seriously, but at the moment I want to work hard, play hard, and I was, sure. I was achieving that. It was, it was good fun. And uh, then I was getting to the point where in London I was enough. You know, it's a big city. I'm a country boy, and it was like, you know, I've had enough of London time to look to move on. And at that time, I was mates with Fergal and got to meet his sister, Marcella, who was, they from Dundalk, but she was living up here in Belfast, ah, working in IT. There it is, Mark. There yeah. it is. <laughs> so, you know it. I should so have known. Was, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved over, um, and our plan then was to move to Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Marcella had been out a few times, but I don't mean out there. She'd met my folks. My folks lived there. She lived my folks. Everything was great, so we're going to move out there. Um, I started a travel business. I thought, okay, I want something where I can live in Zimbabwe but still earn pounds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, fair. Totally so, fair. Yeah, yep. Because I, I knew <laughs> the advantage of that, so I thought, set up the company, uh, move out of Zimbabwe. Uh, the kind of modern post-COVID version of that is like a uh, New York job, Belfast living. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's like there's uh, levels to this game. Uh, yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. kids in Cape Town <laughs> and we were just there who are IT and that, who are doing that digital nomad. Whoa. And they are making a fortune because oh, they're yeah. earning New York wages. And on the weekend, these 20-odd-year-olds will say, let's go on safari and hire a private jet between them and stuff. <laughs> so it is happening. There you go, Daniel. You know what you're doing after your apprenticeship. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was, you know, ended up here little travel company getting going, you know, the ups and downs of a new business and that, but really living it. I really had a passion for what I was doing. And I still do. You know, it's like I love travel. I love Africa. So that was an easy thing. I love my golf, so it was an easy one. And we're doing these luxury golf holidays. And, um, 
then we're like, okay, time to put the house in the market and move out to Zimbabwe. And we're just doing that. And then Mugabe, the farm invasions, so there was a whole lot of things happened which culminated in the farm invasions and Zimbabwe's economy being destroyed and a slippery slope to where Zimbabwe is now being completely destroyed by the greed and, uh, you know, just, yeah, just the greed of a few people. And so we were sitting there going, okay, that's it. We're not going to Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. you know. And it wasn't like I wanted to move to South Africa or Kenya or anywhere else. I'm a Zimbabwe and I want to move home. Yeah, sure. It was like you guys moving around, coming to say, I'll move to France or something. It was yeah, just or not like, the same. Or to be honest with you, it's like, I don't want to go to Dublin. Yeah. It's like, I don't yeah. want to have a podcast called Best in Dublin. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. I even remember this, like a few years into the podcast journey. Uh, actually, Matthew Scott, you got oh, yeah. to franchise this thing. You got to do best Liverpool. <laughs> and I, I uh, remember saying, it's like, I don't, I don't care about Liverpool. I don't yeah. care about Dublin. Yeah. I care about Belfast. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I get it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that would be Matt. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, you know, we decided to stand here and the girls, because we wanted to move before they got to school age. And I always, it was a thing. I wanted my kids to grow up there with the sport and everything else. You know, it was... Uh, and Marcelo knew, knew that too. And, you know, we, we, they, like I said, it was a great place. So then suddenly that sort of dream evaporated. It was like, I get kids into school, great schools here. I mean, that's the one thing. You know, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't like we we're sitting going, this is a disaster. It was, it was like we lived in a beautiful part. We lived in South Belfast. Beautiful friends set up everything. So it wasn't like we're, there was a, a big issue. But, you know, I was going, okay, I'm going to have to park the dream for a bit. And uh, then the kids got into school this and everything else. And life moved on and, and, and Africa just slipped elusively yeah. through your fingers like the final page of the Great Gatsby <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was also sitting there going okay I'm off to Cape Town next week and going playing all the best golf courses along the garden route and then the, oh a few weeks time in the Caribbean playing golf because well, I'm in Mauritius for the 20th time or something <laughs> you know and playing golf and having fun and developing the business building great relationships and friendships with people all over the world so I was still living my best life, isn't it? but still in the back of me was, I'm an African and never got home. Mm. And that really, that that hurt, like it really hurt for a long time. And um, when my parents both passed, it eased off. Once I had less, less family there, you know, and it wasn't, and the country had gone wow. down and you sort of, and that eased off a bit, the pain, it was like, yeah, I still want to get there, but I don't have to. It wasn't this. I've, uh, the, the pain changed. Let's put it that way. <sighs> that is, I would love to zoom in on that. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the pain would have been lower if you really kind of had an actual choice? What I mean by that is if, if, if Zimbabwe was totally mm -hmm. on the table mm -hmm. in its fullest potential, mm -hmm. do you think the pain would have been less? I know you 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 you, you, you got to deal with the cards which are dealt to you. Mm -hmm. And I've dealt with that and I've had a great life and lived it. But yes, there's always this thing. And you wonder, you wonder should you should just say to yourself, get over it. Mm. Yeah. And, and and I tried recently. You know, I had a lovely chat with Marcelo, and we were talking about the same subject to a degree. And it's like, but there's some things you just can't get over or change. It's in you. That's who you are. Yeah. But you know, it's it's the reality of the situation is I live here. I love it here. Yeah, yeah. And then I got reinvolved, new business now, taking me back. Sure. Spending the time in Africa. So yeah, I, the. The pain isn't a pain anymore. It's like a, an under, it's a pain I fully understand now rather than just this gnawing ache. Right. It's, it's something I know which is there and I sort of manage much better, you know. Yeah, it's an, an echo of what it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And so your, your folks passing, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, like, isn't it interesting how, like, in us, mm. even as we get older, mm -hmm. it's like, those roots run so yeah, yeah. so deep. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, like yeah. into our bones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, and uh, my brother lives over here. Like I say, he was around last night for Bry, 
which is like a, a barbecue, but better. Oh, Mark, I'm so glad. I would have <laughs> spent this whole conversation without talking to you about how much I love biltong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love biltong. You should have told me. I make my own. Oh, do you make your in. own? Of course you do. You're South African. And uh, uh, Drovers? Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's her name? Elsa van uh, Staten. Oh, yeah, oh, her yeah, biltong yeah, is just yeah. next level, man. Yeah, it is phenomenal. It's the easiest stuff in the world to make. <laughs> I actually, yeah. so I, uh, one of my little kind of, I'm I'm a phase guy. I just yeah. like get massively into a subject and then abandon it completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's why podcasting works so well because I can just, <laughs> I find something that I can capture all of the phases in. Yeah. And uh, I built like a build tom box and like got yeah. the computer fan and got the yeah. light bulb and like got the wee hooks and just like, oh man, it's so, yeah. so, so much fun. I didn't even put a light. You just need moving air. Mine yeah. doesn't even have the light or heat at all. It's just see, dry, I got dry. I got scammed I, yeah, yeah. by some affiliate Amazon <laughs> marketing scheme. Uh, clearly, <laughs> yeah, but no, I'll make someone bring some into you one oh, of these days. It's, I would definitely, yeah. definitely be up for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. great. But so, no, having my brother over here, uh, my sister passed away in her mid thirties, so mm. I don't have any family living in Zimbabwe anymore. I've got cousins and uncles and aunts and all sorts in South Africa. And that's not home. Zimbabwe's home and I've got no one there. South Africa, I love going there and seeing all these relatives and family and everything else there. But it's not never going to be home in South Africa. It's a place I absolutely love and can't spend enough time there. But it's never home. It's never, it never fills that. It never takes away that pain. Man, that is so, that is so like I'm loving this, right? <laughs> so you like your family mm -hmm. are in a different location, mm -hmm. South Africa, and it doesn't feel like home. Home is still Zimbabwe. Yeah. And it's like, there's a, I don't know where he's from. I think it's somewhere in Asia. I think he's like a philosopher called like, Wai Fu Tuan, maybe. Okay. And he has this concept. He talks about the difference between a space mm -hmm. and a place. Mm -hmm. And he says, the only difference between a space and a place yeah. is a pause. And so a space turns into a place whenever you pause there and okay. you stay there. Mm -hmm. And the longer you stay in that, the longer you stay pausing in that in space, place, the yeah, more yeah. of a place it becomes. becomes yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yep, totally. And so it's interesting that like these geographic locations, like... Well, I've paused here in Belfast for longer than I thought, so it's become much more of a place to me. So when we came back after three and a half months away recently, I just love being back here. Wow. And everyone's going, oh, you must be, you know, hankering for back there in the heat and this and everything. And I'm, no, I'm just loving being back here. Because this is my place now, in a way, mm. and kind of Africa and everything else is a thing I do to have a bit of fun and fill that African itch type thing, <laughs> scratch yeah, yeah. the African itch, yeah. things like that. But yeah, it's my home. You know what I mean? I've got, we've got great friends, uh, great life here. You know, and I've been, been very lucky. I mean, coming out of Belfast in 1993. 1993, after six years in London, so I came here in 93, and it was a tail end of the trouble, so I saw a bit of the pain people went through here and the suffering and everything else and understand, you know, having come from another war situation early in my sure, life yeah, to here. Yeah. And, um, but what I've loved living here is this place has always been going forward. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a dark past moving forward, a bit like Zimbabwe in the 80s, post-war, going forward, I felt that for a long time, yeah. I think that's slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. I think we our political leadership, yeah. We don't even we don't even need to go there. It doesn't have to you don't have to say anything about the political lack of leadership here. Yeah. Um but I do feel Northern Ireland, which was has been heading and trending in such a good direction for a long time, is just bouncing along the bottom. Yeah, not bouncing on the bottom, but just sort of stalled and it's just bouncing along and it needs something to happen now to take us back on that path to, to really great things because the people in the place are great and yeah. the opportunities, everything else, but we're just missing so much. 100%. And I think, like, you can just tell me, no, Matthew, you're wrong, and I disagree with you. I have no problem with that. Yeah. I, maybe you saw this with Zimbabwe to a certain mm -hmm. extent, and I feel like we've seen it with Belfast where it's like, Whenever a, pl a place mm -hmm. is limited by something like a conflict or like mm -hmm. serious economic yeah. downturn, it's like it's almost like I almost see it as like a bow and arrow where mm -hmm. the bowstring's being pulled back yeah, and yeah, back yeah, and yeah, back, yeah. and there's just this unbelievable amount of tension. Yeah, and then yeah. it's like the Good Friday Agreement has just been signed. Oh yeah, yeah and there's just yeah. this like this rocket yeah, energy. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, I think Belfast still, though I agree with everything you've said, I do think Belfast has the opportunity to enter into a golden era. Oh, yeah. But only if we seize it. Yeah, and, and that's a difficult bit. It is how do we get control of it? And that's that's in every country. Zimbabwe has everything to offer. It's still got the tourism, the mineral wealth. It's got everything else. But mm. how do you seize it? That's... You know, I got a little bit involved in the politics of Zimbabwe. We used to go down a city hall here with our placards about Mugabe and that on a Friday lunchtime years ago. We were doing it for ourselves. We weren't changing anything. It of course. Was just, you know, we were just doing it to meet up with other Zimbos, have a bit of fun. And solidarity. Solidarity and all yeah. that and have be able to moan and groan about a movement. But we changed nothing. We sort of realized that we weren't changing much, but it was doing doing something for us in a way and raising a bit of awareness but how you take control of, and, and Zimbabwe, I'd say the bad guys. Yeah, I'd say from the incompetence. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the biggest risk that we face is is like passivity. Mm? You know what mm. I mean? It's like the evil of doing nothing almost yeah. is just yeah. like yeah. almost even mm? scarier sometimes. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're doing. We're sitting. How many years have passed by in Northern Ireland with n no one going and raising a stink about? What's happening? These people are not doing their jobs, taking their salaries, not giving a damn about the rest of us. Mm. And we just sit there and go, well, that's not great, and then go off and play a game of golf or something. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. That's what they, you know, it's sad. I'm as bad as everyone. Mm -hmm. We're all in that same boat. But how do you change it? And that's, sure. That's so I, I, I am under no impression that I am correct and I have the fount of knowledge and I know exactly with my crystal ball the future of what we would do. I do have a hunch, though, and I have a belief. My, my belief is probably better than hunch. I believe entrepreneurship is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I think entrepreneurs are the the leaders of mm -hmm. today, and I think they're leaders of tomorrow. I think in the vacuum created by lack of political leadership, yeah, yeah. I think Northern Ireland has always had a very strong entrepreneurial culture that mm -hmm. has stepped up to do that. I'm really interested in your story because... You are one of the few people, mm -hmm. and this is this is genuinely true, one of the few people on the planet mm -hmm. who have found a way to combine like the deepest passions mm -hmm. and parts of who you are with a business mm -hmm. that actually is profitable and makes an impact. So yeah. it sounds like I'm guessing your journey uh, mm -hmm. massively here, okay? I'm mm -hmm. like I'm like seeing in, in yeah, part, yeah. connect the dots. You know, so you start off your career as in like civil engineering. How on earth do you like make that transition into, yeah, I make money by traveling and playing golf. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think, I think I'm, I'm really stupid because I believe I can do stuff and I choose what I want to do and then try and achieve it. So we just Instead need of to letting take life that happen, part of our brain out. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a bit I'm missing maybe is that I go, what I want to do. So I was sitting going, I want my own business. I was clear of that. I always wanted to have my own business. I always said I'm going to have fun till I'm about 30 and then get into do something on my own. I came here, I was working for a small um, contractor, a civil engineering contractor, a lovely guy. But that wasn't working out. He um, he he wanted. He said he wanted to retire, but he wasn't going to retire. And um, I was meant to be running a business, but somebody over the shoulder, and it wasn't working between us. A lovely guy, and we parted ways. And it was what I do, and I want to start something on my own. And what I want to do, what can I do? What I really want to do, which is have time at home with my family, my folks, uh, have a link with Zimbabwe, maybe create something where I can go back there. Play golf, which I'm really rubbish at, and I was even worse <laughs> then, you know what I mean? And uh, But love. And then, <laughs> you know, sort of go, that's what I want. Right. And what's stopping me doing it? Nothing. So it was like, I don't want to start a civil engineering firm in Belfast when the whole market here was sewn up by a few big companies and not a lot was happening in those days yet. Um and it's Jimmy's cousin, his brothers with his yeah. nephew. <laughs> so it, yeah, it literally was like an I'm this guy who's arrived who's got no contacts, no nothing. And I knew that. So I was like, what strengths do I have? I'm, I, the one strength I have is, is I'm a Zimbabwean. So when I'm, mm. it's like, oh, I like that. When I go to walk down the street, yeah, somebody like Maddie or somebody, somebody will shout, hey, Zim, how are you? <laughs> And I know somebody played sport against you. Evan used to call me Zim back in the day. You know, and I played cricket, yeah, primarily. 
and they knew me as Zim. And a lot of mates still now probably don't know my name's Mark. They just know me as Zim. You know what I mean? So that was something I had. And when I arrived in Northern Ireland, there were no um, no foreigners. There was people were leaving this place, not coming here. You know what I yeah. mean? So there was no one of color. There was no one of – and like I'd go out for beer and people would go, um, you know, sort of looking, hey, big man. <laughs> Yeah. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I'm are you Zimbab- Welshman? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Zimbabwe. And they're like, oh, really? And Chatton's, can I buy you a pint? Wow. And that was, you got to remember back 30 years ago here in this town, you, you walked through it. It was just the whitest of white. Sure. You saw none of color. Yeah. Unless you went to. Like, I was born in 95, Mark. And I, like, I, yeah. my childhood was like white. Yeah. You know? And, and so as foreigners, there were a few. So that was like a, a, a one one thing I had. So when I was in the cricket club, everything else, I talked to people about what I was doing in the travel lane, and it was like, oh, well, yeah, I want to go and play golf out there, or my daughter needs a honeymoon. Can you sort that out mm. and all that? So that gave me a, you know, a nice little leg up being a, a – It was your superpower. It was, You yeah. were differentiated. Yeah. You leaned yeah. into it, and it's the same thing we do yeah. whenever we go to the States and we yeah. have an Irish accent, yeah. overpowered. Yeah. I, I, like we, I was joking with a couple of guys in our boss, <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, I really want to find find my, like, my soulmate and my, mm-hmm. like, my partner. I'm like, literally just moved to America and, like, you all literally have, like, yeah, yeah. Eh, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm really struggling in the local market. It's like, bro, just just <laughs> differentiate yourself. Go, go, go to somewhere else and be the one that stands out. And it's, it's ridiculous. Easy. Job yeah. done. But it's the same with business. Uh, you know, yeah. it's it's very, very powerful. So, you know, you leaned into that. And is it interesting how, like, our reaction as a people, I don't know why I'm including myself in that, people's reaction was like, let me buy you a pint. It's almost like uh, they were so excited to interact with that and interface yeah. with that. And I wonder if there was a little bit of, like, maybe, like, not having the opportunity to, like, interact with outsiders. Yeah. And I, one of the things I used to love about living in New York was, like, the intimacy of strangers. Yeah, yeah. You know, like just that conversation you would have on the subway mm-hmm. and you would you guys would be pouring your heart out to each other and then you'll never see them again. again <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that was London for me when I was younger in London. It was like that. You're meeting all these people and, and it was that sort of like, hold on, I'm never going to see them again. And it was like weird. It's like yeah, I yeah, just yeah. really opened up to somebody there. Yeah. <laughs> and you could. And, and London was, trans, uh, you know, it really transformed me in a lot of ways because you could analyze and rethink yourself by living away. Mm. You could look at things like racism and really analyze the good, the bad, and the ugly about how you'd grown up, where you'd grown up, and everything. When you're living there with your mates, and so that uncomfortable thing, you go back home, you've changed, but your mates haven't changed. Right. It wasn't like they were the worst racists in the world going out beating up people or anything else, but just the tone and the language, and yeah. And you sit with them, and they would uh, say something, and you'd be like, oh my God. And then you go, bite your tongue. You've changed, they haven't. They're not wrong. Mm. They might be wrong in my eyes, but mm-hmm. at the moment, just, you're just going to lose your mate. Yeah. Talk to them slowly about things, try and educate them a bit, change them a bit, but don't try and grandstand because you're just going to lose them as 100%. friends, you know? And that was, it. yeah, so again, London was really allowed me to change and transform as a, a person, you know, learn, grow up and uh, learn a lot, a lot about yourself being in a big city where you're a bit anonymous. Mm. And I found that strange when I came to Belfast where you weren't anonymous anymore. You could walk down the road and somebody said, hey, Zim, yeah. yeah, compared to London, yeah. Belfast the village. You know? it's, it's really interesting. Like uh, we were chatting the other day where it's like, and there's pros and cons to everything, okay? Mm-hmm. A real pro is that like, I, you just cannot burn your bridges mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or you'd be foolish. Yeah, And it, I think it kind of, it, it introduces a level of like extreme accountability where it's like if I if I I'm delivering a project for somebody, it's like I I have to make sure it's it's done right. Yeah, yeah. you know. And if there's problems, I we both have to go out of our way to make mm-hmm. sure that the relationship is intact as we navigate through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And there's something that is kind of familial about that. Mm-hmm. That's that's I, I like it. I like yeah. after living in many different places around the world, big and small. I think I like this way. Mm-hmm. I like the. I like the village. Yeah, yeah. I like the, having grown up on the farm when we were 12 or 13, my grandfather, whose place it was, he passed away and we're in the middle of the war and um, there was petrol rationing and things like that. You know, we, we, there was worldwide sanctions on Rhodesia at the time. So things were tough as a country, you know. 
very entrepreneurial stuff. That created so many entrepreneurs because we had sanctions on us. It was good for the country in a lot of ways. But we had no petrol in then, so then and the, the house we lived in, you could almost walk through, the, walk through the cracks in the wall to get outside. You know what I mean? It was starting to fall apart. My grandfather built it himself by hand, made the bricks. You know, they weren't fire-baked and all that. So then the folks had the decision, build a new house there or move into town. And we moved. It wasn't far. We moved into town. I was 12 or 13, and that was brilliant because growing up on a farm is great fun when you're a kid, but when you're – 13 year old guy you want to be where the party is on where the fun is and everything else right. and then we moved into town and then i had this great teenage life where you're in the and not a big town but in a, you know a small town lots going on a lot of fun all the sport on your yeah everything was right there and we're on the farm you were in the little bubble mm. and that was great and that was great till you're 12 or 13 and then moving into town so i was very lucky how things happened at different stages in my life i've been yeah yeah, you yeah. Know, Everyone talks about you're lucky. Yeah, I, I do genuinely know I've been so lucky in so many ways. I mean, I'm lucky in other ways. You know, of things course. have happened in my life. But I also genuinely am so grateful for the way things have panned out for me. Especially being an African, you've seen how people who've got no control of their lives out there. I've mm. had so much control. I decided what business I do. Mm. I decided to come chat to you today. There's 101 things I decide. Right. There's people living there who just or getting up every day going, how do I eat? Where do I get water? Yeah. Stuff like that. And I do know how lucky I am. Yeah. You, know? and you saw it and you just saying to me when we're getting the coffee on the way, you know, you went to Rwanda and I'd yeah. love to hear a little bit from you as well on yeah. how you found that and how grateful you are now. Uh, 100%. Like, see, you know, I grew up like, med like, let's not beat around the bush. Like, I grew up middle class, Northern Ireland, Lisburn. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it was that. <laughs> and... Uh, you're angsty and you're teenagey and you think, you know, everything's the worst thing in the world and you're so oppressed and, you know, you're so hard done by and whatever. Yeah. And, like, I was I was on some sort of random, like, David Cameron, like, young person exchange program yeah, yeah. thing. It actually, it was a sweet program. Yeah. They f basically funded it. I think I had to pay, like, 800 quid. So I was raising money and yeah. selling T-shirts. Shout out to Carl Fitzsimons, oh, yeah. bunch of stuff. Um. And what they would do is actually they were they took four of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was four from the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and even that, it was like someone from England, someone from Scotland, someone from yeah. Wales. And like I had to go across the water for like training days and stuff. So even that was a, like first mm -hmm. time I f took a flight by myself, like all this sort of stuff. So obviously pre-Africa. Uh, and then so two, four of us and then four Rwandan dudes, the exact same age of us. And we l lived in the same house together. Wow. And we lived in a small little village called Ramagana pretty like very rural yeah, yeah. and it was phenomenal mm -hmm. because it as you were talking about earlier it just gives you a bigger context mm -hmm. for what your life has been like in comparison to the experience of others mm -hmm. good bad and ugly yeah, like, yeah. you know it's uh, it's not just one mm -hmm. and so for me it was seeing that i often say like I, I had a lot of mental health issues when I was growing up yeah. and I'm a suicide survivor oh. and just battled a lot with depression and the, the kind of 11 to 16 phase yeah. especially. And moving to Rwanda for those, it was only three months was the program. It's not a, a lot, but it felt like 10 summers. That's a long time though. Um, and it was the healthiest and the best I've ever felt in my life. Yeah. And so when you're talking about growing up on the farm, barefoot, eating yeah. things from yeah. the tree and the yeah. sun, like... Yeah. I know what that feels like. And no social media or I, We had no internet. Anything, yeah. We didn't even have electricity yeah, half the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there was something very, very healing mm -hmm. for me that mm -hmm. took place there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And very res very restorative. And I, this kind of ties into something that I wanted to talk about. So this might seem like a strange bridge, okay? You talked about how like the rations were good for the entrepreneurship Oh, massively. Right. And I, I think scarcity, mm -hmm. necessity is the mother of all invention. invention yeah, okay. Totally. And like I, I mentioned Great Gatsby earlier. So now like the pages are like run through my head. That's <laughs> just the way my brain works. And like first page of the Great Gatsby, there's a quote that says something like, life is more successfully looked through one window. Okay. And the, the very convoluted question that I want to ask yeah, you yeah. is, do you think that like the limitations that you put on yourself as an entrepreneur, basically like, here's what I need my business to be, mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. and golf, mm -hmm. 
that doesn't seem like it's going to work. But do you think that actually the scarcity involved in that actually f- just forced you to like figure it out? It's a very, very good question. And when I started, I had one product, Golf to Zimbabwe, not even Golf to Africa. Oh, like unreal. So how stupid is that to the outsider? So somebody be sitting going, how does it, that, that's just stupid. So I did led you, the old led you here, which was like a government scheme where you could get startup funds. I went to them and they said, you need to give us some market research. And I said, I can't. <coughs> So I said, if I go stop in the street corner and ask a thousand people, would you play golf in Zimbabwe? Everyone is going to look at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> so I, I just left there. I said, I, I can't make these people see what I'm seeing. But I had a desire to make it work. I understood the country was awakening and everything else. And so, so to me, it was like, it's not only ever going to be Zimbabwe. I can do more. And we did soon do South Africa and Mauritius and Thailand and Caribbean and everything eventually. But it was, you got to start somewhere. And it's, it was brilliant yesterday. I was at Malone Golf Club um, playing a bit of golf, and I walked out, and there's elderly gentleman sitting on the bench and, and a lady over here, and he goes, hey, Mark, I was talking to friends. I didn't notice him. And it was a lovely guy, Govan Peel, and it was my first ever customer. Wow. And, you know, and, I, and his wife said to him, and he said, how did you ever find, how did Govan ever find you, she said. And I said, oh, I was driving along. I saw there's a golf event at Beaver, and I made some little – I went home and printed up some little <laughs> black and white things in it about golf in Zimbabwe, and I stuck them under people's windscreen wipers. Oh, I there. love it. Come on. And these four guys from Malone, and I met another one who was there with, came to meet Gervin yesterday, two of the, my first ever four customers. Um, and Gervin's going on 99. He doesn't play golf anymore, but it was great to see him up at the club. But it was at, uh, um, okay, I got a sale. And there's a decent margin in it. I put a reasonable margin in. I made reasonable money for my time and effort. I was going, and I don't need a thousand holidays. I don't need ten thousand. I need a handful. Right. And that's all I need, and that's going to cover my costs. I'm working from home. I'm the original home worker. And all that <laughs> Before sort of it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my uh, the internet came along, and my brother was around last night. He is. <laughs> chatting with his kids about it and says, yeah, this used to be my office here and it's a front room. And he says, yeah, I moved over here and your dad and I went off and bought a computer and we brought Dreamweaver, the software stuff. And I knew- oh, I built my, my first website IT. on Dreamweaver. Yeah, and my brother's yeah. IT guy, but never built a website. And I bought him the software and the computer and said, we're building a website. <laughs> <laughs> and Marcella being an IT said, this is really important. You get a website. And we did that. And so it was all like common sense. And, the, the you know, like- I know I've been lucky. That's the one thing I'm quite lucky. I was born with common sense. I see things, I understand things a little bit, and I move with it. And I go with gut feeling and that. Mm. It's not all deep analysis which led you wanted. I could never give them that. But I always knew there was enough there. And if that didn't quite work, you go in slightly different directions and make things work. And that's, you know, the golf in Zimbabwe moved to golf in South Africa more. And then for years we became like the biggest company doing golf into Mauritius. We were the first company in, and we just grew and grew and grew. And that was like part of the journey. I never, ever would have expected that at one stage, like 80% of the business was going to Mauritius. Or something. And we're just n- nailing it, absolutely smashing it. But that wasn't like when I started going to lead you, by the way, I'm going to go to Mauritius and this is going to happen. You didn't know that. You had to but just sort of like go with the instinct. And I've always had uh, a reasonable amount of common sense, stubbornness, and not being the brightest guy, just get on with it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I get away with it. You know, it's like you just go, I'm doing it, but I'm not scared if it doesn't work out. I'll make a plan to make it work in a way or learn why that doesn't work for that. So that means I need to do X. It's like yeah. 100%. So, yeah, and I think anyone who starts a business and ends up with the business they started, it's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, but it's, it's the power of like going deep mm-hmm. instead of going wide and like yeah. picking a very 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 specific niche mm-hmm. for a very specific type of customer for a very specific location yeah people who like golf who want to go to zimbabwe like on paper you're like this is never, never gonna, gonna work, gonna work yeah. but it, like the americans have a class thing where they say it doesn't work with our accent but it works with theirs they say the riches are in the niches yeah, yeah, yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> and brilliant you know, once because once you nail mm-hmm. golf to Zimbabwe, 
there's the model. Yeah. And like, you can just pretty much take that model anywhere once you've done the hard work of figuring out, like, as I'm sure your first trip must have been a nightmare to organize and you were like, ah, oh, I'm so scared and the hotels. Yeah, but the bet you your 10th trip, you were just like. You, 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 it's a, and still like that, like with me, it's always been, you just think it through. You think, okay, somebody's got to get to the airport. They're then getting on a plane. Right. They're getting off. Who's meeting them? When they get to that hotel, what's happening? How are they getting to that golf course? Mm. Is that booked? I just literally think through the whole journey backwards and forwards in my mind and go, what are the little bits which could go wrong here? Mm. Be the and, customer, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the problem is with Africa is there are things which can go wrong and are a bit complicated. So that's to our advantage mm. because if it was easy – you're not needed. And that's why we want to go with go you. Go to specialists. So I've always gone for niche specialists. Yes, right? yes. Niche special stuff. I always go. Because so, you solve those problems yeah. for us. You know, yeah. all those things. Well, what about this? And what about this happens? And what about that? And like, yeah. da, 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 da. It's and like, oh, no, Mark, even think Mark, Mark's got it. Yeah. And yeah. things you won't even think of. We've sorted out. Hmm. So on this recent trip, I was in Namibia, Zambia, and Kenya, playing the golf courses, seeing the hotels, taking flights into the Maasai Mara, doing all sorts of things. And I've found a whole lot of things which are real danger points for us flying high-end customers in who expect Sunday. And only by doing it yourself do you learn that, and then you can go and fix it. So like as we were talking about Rwanda, we want to do golf into Rwanda. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to do that till I've been there and seen it because there's going to be some glitches I don't know about now. It all sounds easy. Put somebody in a plane, they go, this hotel, play that course. But sure. So, um, yeah, that's – the bit I'm enjoying now, when we started the first business, it was niche and golf into Zimbabwe. Then it grew into South Africa, which is now a big golf destination, so it's, everyone's doing it. Mauritius, everyone's now doing You know, We, we were the forerunners in that. So now we, I want to do the stuff, which is we're the forerunners in this new places like golf in Namibia, golf in Zambia, mm. you know, golf in Rwanda, Uganda. Africa's got a so many golf courses being built at the moment. There's so much more money there than people believe. The disparity of wealth is a big problem, but there's huge wealth in Africa, mm. and, and it's growing. So I'm looking at all that and going, what is the bit I love in business is being that guy who knows something other people don't know, and I can use that to my advantage in a way. And this trip was learning a lot about that, and then going, how do we apply it? And uh, not have competitors say so you – your margins can be decent. You're not getting, you know, it's not fighting over price. You, you, you're, you're providing quality and you're getting paid in return for it. Without sticking the arm in, just everyone's got them. But once you enter a mass market, it's not me. I don't, I don't mm. enjoy that. I can't pile them and sell them cheap. That's, that's not my model. There, but there is something so enjoyable about that very hands-on service mm -hmm. type environment. Yeah. You know, where it's like you can really like really design a customer experience that mm -hmm. like brings genuine awe and delight to somebody. Totally. And you just don't get that uh, going to McDonald's. But you get a good chef, Michael Dean. Yep. I bet you he walks in and sees people having a great meal oh. and sees them savoring. And if you're in that top room and if, he, and, and, if yeah. he, and if you see him cooking for you, yeah. next level. Now yeah. you can walk into McDonald's and you can be in awe of the operational efficiency and oh, the yeah, process. Yeah. Like it's just insane, but it's different. Yeah, but it's not the passion. Yeah, it's not the passion. Yeah. 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 And that's, uh, that's what life's about is passion, being passionate about things, doing things with passion and all that. And if you're not, that's fine. Not mm. everyone's the same, you know, but for me, if it's not, I quickly get bored. I'm, I'm so easily bored. I'm always ready to move on and do different things and try things. Uh, not always the shiny new thing takes my attention, but I'm always sort of going, I could be doing more. I could still be doing this, but a little bit more of this yeah, and a yeah, bit yeah. of that and yeah. doing different things. Yeah, That's great. Well, I like our, we love your story so much for a lot of reasons. <laughs> One of the reasons I love it is because I, I think it's a really powerful message that you can monetize your passion. Yeah. And that entrepreneurship and business is this tool probably the only tool on the planet that allows you to bring all of the, your niche interests and passions mm -hmm. together, package it up in a way to serve a specific audience that can actually deliver massive amounts of value for well, you, like, your customers, for everybody. Like it's, it's but go, like Daniel and you know, the younger generation now, they've got that. They, they've worked out. Yeah. 
you know, th those who are in a position where they can have mm -hmm. worked it out. Like I say, these uh, digital nomads in Cape Town and right. in Rio de Janeiro and all over the world now, you know, in Belfast, you'll have people coming from different places and basing themselves, you know, and living their best life and and choosing what they want to do. And I see it with yeah, my younger daughter. I see it with her friends and others. They are so far ahead of where I was at their age in terms of doing what, you really want to do mm -hmm. yourself and don't compromise. You know, it's sort of, um, I was lucky I was sort of born that way a little bit. So I've always done that, but it's, I see it so much in so many in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. They really are not compromising. Yes. They're making decisions and doing stuff. And I take my hat off to them and, mm -hmm. and people say, oh, well, you know, they, they want everything. I say, yeah, you do want everything. Go, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the key message that you've shared today is as well you have to take action, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that classic, like you can't, no one has ever plowed a field by turning it over in their mind. No, no. I no, think no. though, if I can, if I can dump on your generation, uh, Daniel, for one second, I actually mind too, millennial, millennial would be quite like this as well, is there's a lot of dreams mm -hmm. and there's a bit of a delay in actually moving, taking the first step, Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. which is, as we know, it's it's the hardest bit. Mark, I've loved this genuinely. Like yeah. it's, this has been <laughs> a, a, a roller coaster yeah. travel, hot air balloon around the world. It's been very, very enjoyable. We covered a bit totally. of bit of everything here, yeah. a bit of philosophy, a bit of politics. Yeah. Did not expect that. Great yeah. Gatsby coming out there, mad men. It was like, that was the whole shebang. Wow. Uh, land in the plane. Mm -hmm. Let's think of, a, think of a banger way to end. <laughs> Okay, if you were to reverse your business and you were to take people from Zimbabwe to Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. um, where would you take them? Well, they're probably all watching Game of Thrones. So. <laughs> 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 they're going to do that. No, no. Um, I just love driving up the Antrim coast, that road, hmm. stopping somewhere, having a bite to eat, going for a walk or a hike up there, you know, and around that, that north coast and everything. Or down into the Morns, and that that's what I love about Northern Ireland is a but also Belfast. Belfast for a tourist, it's a small town. You can wander around, it's safe. My kids get they're going off to do stuff in town when they're probably too young to to bed. You felt that okay in Belfast, you know what I mean? It is a good, safe place for people. So I do think also, you know, you'd say to people, come to Belfast and have fun. And then go see all these other beautiful things, but come back at night in this place and have some nice cocktails and some great food and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the crack of Northern Ireland. And, mm -hmm. the, and that, that's probably the, the superpower for Northern Ireland is the people. Yeah, honestly, it's like it's there's, you, you can't create that stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's the troubles created it a bit, the natural way of the people. Yeah, and a lot of things have created a unique bunch of people, yeah, which <laughs> I've been privileged enough to have 30 years, 30 odd years now living amongst and really enjoying. Yeah, I mean, there's, the, the, it's, a, it's a special place. And so for me, that's what I'd be selling is the, the people and thing. But also you're going to see some amazing scenic beauty. Sure. Yeah. What's your cocktail? <laughs> Cold beer with a steak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Zimbabwean, you know That's what I mean? I'm, si I'm simply pleased. A good steak, you know, and uh, um, uh, my favorite drink here would be Guinness, actually. No. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if I'm in the sun, it's got to be a cold lager with a, with a nice steak. And I've had plenty of those in the last few months. I bet there. you have. So if you were to take anyone from Northern Ireland out for a, a pint, mm -hmm. dead or alive, who would you take? Uh, where would you take them and why? It's a, it's a, it, I'd like to take the the Chuckle Brothers. Yeah. And sit on with them and work out that dynamic, dynamic of how those people who are so different manage to work together because that's a powerful story for everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So that maybe, you know, and that's an odd one, but it's something I never, you know, I've read a lot of stuff about people like Mao and you name every despot in history, you know. Um, and one day my wife said, That's, you're just reading about all these bad people all the time. And I was trying to understand Mugabe, why right. he's destroying my country. And I think those two guys try and understand our two people who absolutely from different ends of mm -hmm. the spectrum, totally different ways, could actually work together and create something I, yeah, I think there's a real lesson somewhere in there, and I'd love yeah. to dig into that. So it was that was before my time, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, 
And every time I go to IKEA, there's a big photo of them in IKEA yeah. together. I think I think Ian's sitting down and maybe okay. Martin's standing up and they're just roaring with laughter. After, yeah. And, Explain that one. Oh man. And I look at it and every time I'm there, I can't I've never actually said this publicly before. Every time I'm there, I actually look at the photo and I like I almost like well up. Like I almost yeah. get a bit tearful. Yeah. yeah. And it's quickly followed by like a deep longing. It's like I if I if only it had a if the timeline of history had been different. Man, I would have loved to have done a podcast with the two of oh, those yeah. guys. Together. Not yes, individually. together. Yeah. Like, how insane yeah, yeah. That would, would be that just, be? Yeah, yeah. Magic. Uh, yeah, like. yeah. But it just seemed that, you know, the chemistry of people is amazing. Huh? Yeah. And in their case, yeah. No, so I don't know. That's a strange one, but probably, mm. yeah, we got lots of um, other great people from this place. Rory, obviously. and mm. Uh, Mark Allen now, you know, with the Snooker World number one, he's just gone to today mm. or yesterday. You know, there's loads of good people and all the rest yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. Final question, Mark. Mm-hmm. Landing the plane for real, for real. Yeah. Coming in for landing. Yep. If you could. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. Where are my manners? You're letting me take it this way? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Awesome. Yeah, you bring us in for London, you know, you uh, pass you over, okay, you can now, steering control is activated. I don't know how places work. <laughs> we're landing the plane, we're taking out the landing gear. Um, <laughs> make sure you're in your seatbelts and all that. Um, so my question for you is, if you could go back in a time machine to um, 18, and go for 18. Just go for your age, what are you? Are you I'm 19. Mm-hmm. Milk that card while you still can. That's good. A few more weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so if you can go back to a 19-year-old version of yourself, mm-hmm. what would you say? That's deep. Good um, delivery, Daniel. That was it's powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, go easy on yourself, you know. And I, I think that, I think most people should do it. You overthink things in your own brain, and you know you've suffered with mental health. I haven't. I'm just lucky. No matter what world throws at me, I've somehow coped with. It doesn't mean the voice in my head's not talking to me at times. <laughs> Brother, yeah. And I do think now that I'm 60, I've learned to tell her to shut up. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and just go, you're not, you're not talking sense. You, you're, just, you're just all the little things from when I was younger and all the little things happened in your life created this voice which picks away and stuff and you don't need to listen to it. And I wish at 19 I could have, just turn that voice, understood you can turn the voice off a bit and just um, forgive yourself for things. Mm. And that's been, that's a very powerful thing, you know, to, to just learn to go, I made mistakes and then go, I forgive myself. I, and I forgive those around me who made mistakes around me and stuff. And I think if I could teach myself at 19 that you can forgive yourself for your mistakes then and every mistake you make along the way without compromising what you do because you go, I can forgive myself. That yeah. genuinely show remorse to yourself, you know, forgive yourself in a genuine way. I think it'd be the one thing I'd do. Does that make sense to you? You're only 19. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. We were actually talking about this yesterday with a couple of the guys in normal parts mm-hmm. and um, they give two like, really interesting, I don't even know what you call these things, like things to do, life hacks, practical mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Who the hell knows? I'll, I'll say it and then you'll... But that voice in their head, mm-hmm. they said, they, sometimes I just reach up to their ear and pretend they turn off their hearing aid. Yeah, okay. <laughs> literally do that. Yeah. And, go, yeah. and there's something about that, the physical action yeah. of that. It's just kind of like makes it a little bit real. And the other one, this sounds hilarious. The guy was an, an ex-smoker. He says that he likes to uh, literally like pretend to like take a cigarette out of the packet, yeah. like light it, put it in his mouth and take a really long drag. Yeah. Like just like the big inhale, just like a, <sighs> hold it. Yeah. And he's like, hold and hold the thought. Okay, think about the thought as hard as you can. And then literally... XL and then just go ping. Wow. And yeah, flick it's like it, the cigarette away. Oh, that's a, that's a good good tool. Uh. It's powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time I heard it, I was like, what a load of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. And I remember uh <laughs> I remember being in the car one day and I was like, I hope no one sees me do this. <laughs> <laughs> ping. ping out the window. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Oh Mark, genuinely, I uh, really, really appreciate your time. No, you know, I'm very grateful for you inviting me. I don't know why I got invited in. You've got a little bit of a story to tell, but compared to the people you've oh, had in you. Oh, no, no, um, no, no, But no. I've really enjoyed listening to your podcasts. I've listened to a good few over the years. And, it's great. Uh, you know, very grateful for the opportunity. No, genuinely. And like, we're grateful. Thank you to North Irish Connections for, mm-hmm. for making this whole thing possible today. Like we said at the top, it's niconnections.com. It's where you can go and see. It's like over 30 episodes in the series where we talk to the diaspora, as mm-hmm. we call them. 
Um, not not that we invented that term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that term's been around for a oh, while. Yeah, we yeah, actually yeah. they actually are just called the diaspora. Mm-hmm. And there's a, a Kraken newsletter you can sign up mm-hmm. for, which is where you can get uh, diaspora stories delivered to your inbox and more tips and tricks, like we said earlier, for moving to Northern Ireland for the first time, open up a business in Northern Ireland, or returning back home. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate you. Thanks for producing. Uh, Mark, thanks again. And thank you so much for listening and watching. Cheers.